let's talk about the Horizon line in HDU and why it's different from a traditional HUD, which of course the Apache does not have. It does not have a HUD. It just, just has HDU that follows us all the way around. So already it's very different than what most people think. But Brad, in, in your best words, uh, describe why it's why it is the way that it is and what it's doing. I think the simplest way that I can kind of try to explain it is that um, as opposed to a traditional HUD, which is fixed mounted to the dash of the aircraft, um, the Apache obviously doesn't feature that same thing. So they, what they did was they put it in your right eyeball. With it being in your right eyeball, um, I no longer want it fixed to the nose of the aircraft, as it being the horizon line, because now it would force me to always have to look forward, um, which would not be a good thing at night. What this allows me to do with the horizon line being fixed to the line of sight as my reference is I can look down and left and still be able to know what the actual pitch attitude of the aircraft is or uh, roll attitude and all that kind of stuff without having to come all the way back to the nose of the aircraft, which could be very disorienting at night. You know, they really just took that HUD, fixed HUD, put it in your eyeball and then made a fixed point of reference, the line of sight as your means of determining what your pitch and roll attitude right. is essentially what you're saying is it's it's two different things wrapped up in the one because and i'd have to fire up one of the fighters with uh, the helmet mounted display to, to kind of see the difference but but uh, but i know that looking left out of the hornet or the a10 you, the horizon line is, is fixed to the horizon that doesn't really help me understand the pitch of my aircraft just just a, a quick reference to something but what we're saying with the hdu is that i can look left i've got all this data that's still telling me what the nose of the aircraft is doing. And I don't even have to look forward. I can tell that the aircraft is still pitched uh, where I left it, essentially, um, because the line of sight cue. And we don't see it really good in this video because there's not, not a whole lot of dynamic movement of the aircraft. But if that, if that nose were to pitch over, that line of sight cue is going to go below the horizon line. And so I can be looking 90 degrees out the left and, and tell that my nose is pitched over. Or the opposite, if the line of sight cue is well above the horizon, then I know my nose is pitched back, right? Yep. And then roll, obviously, it's it's telling us the roll, and I think that's pretty pretty obvious. I, th I still think it's going to be confusing to people, but again, their their frame of reference is is fighters, and and I, I get that, and I understand it, but I, I guess the way that I think about it is the TGP, how they have those little indicators a little, little turn and pitch indicators uh at the bottom of the screen to let people know that when they're staring heads down into that tgp they have some reference of what the aircraft is doing and that's essentially what this is doing for us as well yeah i think that's a fair way of putting it for the for the uh pinvis i mean what are your thoughts when you see it play out in the video and, and everything like how how accurate are you thinking that is oh for me i think it it as far as FLIR simulations go, um, it's probably the closest I've seen anyone get to actually getting that um, kind of true difference in in like that that minimum temperature yeah. play that that happens um, across the the spectrum of heat, the heat yeah. spectrum or whatever you know. Um, yeah, like it looks really natural and believable, you know. Yeah, I think it looks really good. Um... And that's a good point that I don't think people, I know I didn't understand it until I became a pilot and started messing with thermal imaging and the, the Kiowa and everything, but not everything is heated the same, right? I mean, there's different temperatures. And so these mm -hmm. systems have a uh, minimum resolvable temperature variation that they can detect. Um, I know with the Kiowa, I think it was like a two degree difference. You know, there was this this crossover of, of energy and I'm sure the FLIR is probably a little bit better. I can't remember, but um it's not just something is hot or something is cold, which I kind of feel like the old FLIR or the old, you know, DCS FLIR and thermals kind of look like, but now it, it has some gradient to it. So yeah, I think it looks a lot more, a lot more realistic. Um, and as far as the Penvis, I mean, it looks like it's doing pretty good as far as the, the motion of the head, you know, what's 120 degrees per second. So, I mean, you, you'd have to really whip your yep. head around for the, for the Penvis to not stay with you. Um, obviously the TADS is, is nauseating, <laughs> um, but I guess they're updating that. I think the, the newer echoes are actually, they're changing the TADS bucket to turn as fast as a Penvis or something. Oh, that'd be kind of cool. I wonder if it's maybe like limited to flying, um, you know, up it, up it for flying and yeah. then keep 
the slower rate for gunning or something. That would actually be really useful. Yeah, that would be. Now that you now that you say it that way, that would be good. Like if depending on which mode you have it selected in, if it's a sight or a sensor. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, in the video, I know Wags is a little out of trim, and he he jokes about it, but uh, the FLIR kind of looks wonky. Is that a gameism or is that a trimism? Like as far as a little cockeyed. Well, okay. So if the aircraft is out of trim, um, yeah, you would end up having a slight difference in angle uh, between like the flight path of the aircraft and then where the clear clear is looking. Um, so you would, you know, if your nose is off to the left or whatever, you would have to look to the right to actually look in the direction that you're truly flying, right? What your actual ground track is. Uh, so that's that's pretty normal. And then and then you know just resolving that in your head because you're ten foot behind and three feet above that pinvis turret. You know now you got that parallax effect that's that's taking place there. Uh, just that's just because of that angular difference between the two. Um, so you know you could be two three degrees to the left with the nose looking two three degrees maybe four degrees to the right and in the cockpit you know you you notice that uh but then in the image it's different so yeah and the and the image because i honestly don't remember it's been so long the image doesn't um the, the pinvis can't roll right i mean it's from a roll standpoint it's fixed correct. to the center line of the aircraft so if you correct. if the aircraft is rolling the pinvis is going to roll it's not going to correct so if you're out of trim uh, which he's substantially out of trim in the video. Um, it it's gonna be a little, little off kilter. So, okay. Yep. Well, that's another thing that'll throw people is that a hover, right? You you look left or right, you perceive the world is tilting. Uh, right. It's yeah, not. Right. I, I mean, it is, but it isn't, right? Because <laughs> you're five. Because you're five degrees nose high. Yep. And so now it's pointing five degrees nose high which means when you turn it to the left yeah there's gonna be an angle that, that's right i forgot about that because not only is it disorienting because your your right eyeball is now 10 feet away from your left eyeball but, but yeah it's a little bit cockeyed too um i liked in the video too and i know you see it all the time with students is is chasing the symbology to, to hover <laughs> which i yep. always thought was just a lot of fun <laughs> and yeah. we all do it you know we're all when we're learning because because they they kind of beat into your head to let to, you know let the symbology help you but, but what they probably should say is let the symbology help you except for hovering you know <laughs> just just hover like a normal helicopter absolutely i think what people don't understand when they first start using it is just how sensitive it is and so you overreact to the sensitivity you know, I think I think yeah. if you if you were to put this type of system in any other helicopter, you would have the same results. You know, like you would just be flying a a, a Blackhawk or a Kiowa, hovering it just like you would normally. But if you suddenly had symbology telling on you, you would see it whipping all around, and you'd be like, "Oh my god!" Because I think that that's what Apache guys do is they s seem to think that if if the ball is not centered, then I'm not hovering. You know, I don't have a controlled hover, and the reality is a controlled hover is going to have some movement left and right for the most part. Yep. Well, because that's that's part of the thing with the acceleration cue, right? Is is it's it is predictive in nature, and it's right. supposed to tell you, you know, like, hey, you set the the acceleration cue at say halfway between the uh, tip of the line of sight and the lubber line. That's three knots at hover, thirty knots at transition. Right? The aircraft right. will get there. The velocity vector will follow right. uh, and seek the center of that acceleration cue. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. So because it is kind of predictive, you know, anytime you move that cyclic, um, that acceleration cue is moving all over the place and, and you're and that's people chase it. You know, uh, it took a long time to finally realize, you know what, I'm I'm a helicopter pilot, too, and I can actually look outside and not use symbology yeah. to maintain a stable hover. And once yeah. I figured that out and started looking through the symbology and just and just use that outside world again or the FLIR video. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it smoothed out quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. I can almost remember the day that I, that I did that. I know it was at Fort hood on the airfield, just hovering around and just saying, screw this. And I just looked outside, you know, and then just, just stabilize the hover. So yeah, I think we all kind of reached that, that point and, uh, yeah, it's important. So it's going to be fun to watch, watch players go through the same struggle. All right. Well, I think we've solved the riddle of the Sphinx here, hopefully. And, um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there'll be more questions. I'm sure people will still struggle, uh, but 
I mean, I, I think it's just one of those things. Once you get, once you play with it and get used to it, I, you know, people try a little bit too hard to overthink some of these things, especially when it's in preview mode. And they're trying to solve these these riddles early on. Just just jump in it, play around it, and and you'll probably understand why it's that way. So. Yep. Well, cool, Brad. Thanks for taking the time. Yes, sir.